by reading and discussing the article uh, about the technological innovation in Japan, um, we already had a good understanding of why uh, Japanese are so good at um, innovating, right? Or uh, especially improving the existing ideas or products. Okay. Um, now, in this video, we're going to dig deeper and see if we can find any uh, historical reasons for that, okay? Um, or, or to explain why Japan is so good at innovation, all right? And uh, historical reason here, uh, we have to go back, uh, all the way back to the year 645, okay? And in that year, uh, Japan uh, did uh, uh, what's uh, so-called the Taika reforms. Okay? Uh, it's a very historical, very important historical moment. And um, Taika reforms basically means great reforms in Japanese. Okay? And um, that is the year when they start learning um, a lot of things from outside world, especially from China. Okay? And um, the purpose of that reform uh, was similar to what we mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, during the major, uh, major restoration. Um, it's the greater centralization. In other words, the reformers actually want to have a better control of the country. Okay? They want the centralization of the power uh, through the reforms. And uh, what exactly they did, um, there are many different things. And uh, among them, uh, economically, they also did the land reform and improve its uh, bureaucratic system. Okay? Uh, again, um, through uh, the, to achieve a better control of the, uh, of the country. And um, they also send a lot of students to China and learn their uh, culture, okay? especially about the Confucianism and ideas and philosophies. Okay? They, these uh, students also learn uh, Chinese writing system and the classical literature. Okay? And um, even including the religions. Okay? Uh, the Buddhism in Taoism, uh, also the agricultures, etc. Okay, so they pretty much learned everything from China. Okay, and um, that was again the moment they realized that you know uh, they have to learn from the outside. And um, back then they find that you know uh, China is uh, kind of the rule model, so um, they made a lot of efforts to learn. Um, you know, the civilization or the culture from China, okay? Now, the reason we want to briefly talk about the Taika reforms is because um, we want to see that, you know, in Japanese history, uh, the country um, had been a good student, a good learner uh, for such a long time. So it has a good tradition of learning. Now this is quite important because um, sometimes you may heard about these uh, people saying that uh, your attitude determines your altitude. Your attitude determines your altitude. So this means that you know um, um, how you or how seriously you take a thing uh, would determine you know how much you can achieve. Okay. Now here, um, altitude. I want to you know uh, explain a little bit more um, about this word. Altitude um, it, it definitely means your achievement, right? Attitude means here not only the work ethics we often mentioned, okay, like you you're supposed to work hard, but in this case, you know, um, it's more about how you. Um, cope with what you already knew, okay? So um, a simple example could be, 
uh, if you as a student and I as an econ professor uh, both sat in another uh, econ class, let's say um, public finance, okay, and um, taught by a different econ professor. And uh, because it's your first time to be exposed in all kinds of the public finance theories and models, so uh, you are kind of the blank piece of paper, okay? So you would absorb and uh, you know whatever taught by that professor, okay? But for me, you know, uh, because I received the years of training when I was in graduate school, right? I took uh, you know several public finance courses uh, in the program, in the, um, the graduate program. So I already had something in my mind. So when I sat in that classroom, uh, when I was exposed to, you know, what whatever this uh, professor uh, teaches, then I may constantly be bothered by what I already knew before. In other words, I could say that, well, Oh, this is different from what I knew before. This is different from, you know, the way I'm familiar with, right? Or I would say, you know, um, the the way this professor explains the idea or the concept is not probably the best one. You know, I, I have the best one or the better one, I'm sorry. So, um, again, all of these things, um, I constantly would compare you know, uh, what I have been taught and uh, what I knew before entering this classroom, okay? And sometimes that may not be good, okay? And um, it, it doesn't help me with learning, okay? And um, especially learning from that specific professor, all right? So uh, when it comes to the Japanese experience, we find this is quite important because the country for uh, more than a thousand years uh, have been constantly learning from the outside or more specifically from China. So they know how to learn effectively. Okay? They are pre pre uh, very efficient uh, learners. Okay? And one thing here is, you know, if you want to learn, you have to put aside what you already knew. Okay? And you have to be humble. And um, this is definitely the case in Japan, but it's not the case probably in China. Okay? So um, uh, we you know, discussed the Meiji Restoration, right? Starting from 1860s. Uh, what we didn't say is back then, China was also forced to open its door to Westerners. Okay. And they had also, you know, um, to trade with um, Americans, uh, Europeans, okay. uh, after the two op opium wars. Now, um, but the situation is quite different between China and Japan. Okay. And um, here, let me give you a, a quick example. Um, in the two... Uh, documentaries about the major restoration, I believe they mentioned briefly that um, when uh, the Westerners uh, went to Japan, they took a lot of new things, the new inventions, technologies to Japan. Okay? One of the things was uh, the locomotive, in other words, the, you know, the, the head of the train, okay, which uh, pulled the train forward. And um, we find that um, they said the daimyo okay, were uh, very interested in the locomotive. Okay? And uh, their uh, Japanese mechanics, the technicians, uh, very quickly wanted to figure out, you know, how to make that. Okay? They uh, want the, you know, the, the designs and the tools, and they also want to, you know, put them together and see if they can build it. Okay, so again, from that um, piece of information, we we know that the Japanese are, you know, from the the ruling elite, the daimyos, to the baron, you know, the technicians, the mechanics, uh, 
are all pretty eager to know what's going on outside. Okay, and um, again, that's their tradition. Okay, they have been doing that for um, many, many years, or hundreds, or tens of hundreds of years. Um, but for China, it's quite different. So um, when Westerners went to China, they also took uh, a train set. Okay, again, including the locomotive, uh, and they also invited um, the uh, emperor, uh, Empress uh, Cixi, to take a train ride. Uh, Cixi is actually the wife of uh, the Emperor Shenfeng. Uh, after the emperor died, uh, Cixi seized the power and become the supreme ruler of China, okay, since uh, 1860. So again, there's almost the same time, okay, uh, between Japan and China when they were challenged by Westerners. Okay, so they invited Sushi to take a train ride, and uh, Sushi did, okay, uh, go and uh, take a ride. Um, but you know, back then the the locomotives. Um, or the the engine, the steam engine was very low, uh, loud. Okay, so um, you know once the the train gets started, uh, the impress so she immediately found that it was you know too noisy. Okay, so she was actually scared by uh, the the sound of the engine, and um, you know what she did, she. Had the people under her uh, to shut down the engine and put several horses in the front to pull the train forward. Okay, that sounds crazy, right? Because the purpose of this the ride is to you know um, have some experience with the the you know most uh, the latest technologies. Okay, or they developed. In uh, by the Westerners, but what she did is, you know, she doesn't like it, so she still went with, you know, the traditional way, the horse-driven, uh, like you know, the uh, vehicles okay, in the old days. Uh, but again, um, this uh, comparison could tell us that, you know, because Chinese back then, they, you know, for such a long time in history. They believe they've been the rule model. They've been the leaders, so they kind of look down to everything else uh, outside of China, okay? and that really put them in a disadvantageous position uh, when they learn, you know, or start learning uh, the Western uh, technologies. Okay, um, during the same time in Japan, um, there are many. Uh, you know what they call the founders of the modern Japan. Okay, one of them is uh, uh, Fuku Fukuzawa. Okay, and um, Fukuzawa is an author, writer, and a thinker. Okay, um, during the Meiji Restoration, and later people call him one of the founders of modern Japan. Okay, now he uh, published a lot of books uh, to introduce the Western civilization. To Japan, okay, and um, simply speaking, his idea, or at least one thing he may, um, constantly advocating uh, in his books is goodbye Asia, and hello Europe or or uh, Westerners. Um, in other words, uh, he he would say that you know um, Japan uh, is no longer an Asian country. And um, he advocated that the Japanese society should open its door widely and embrace the Western civilization. Okay? Again, here you would see a big difference between uh, the Chinese attitude and Japanese attitude towards the new ideas, new technologies. Okay? We believe that's um, kind of the historical reason. Helping us understand why Japan could do a much better job in terms of innovation.